Good everybody. I'm going to call this uh, meeting to order at 6.30 p.m. We do have at least 12 board members present, either on Zoom or um, in the room here. So are there any amendments to the agenda? Okay, hearing none. I'm going to open it up for public comment. Uh, just a reminder that we will be timing it for three minutes per person. And we ask that you not speak twice until everyone who wants to have a chance has a chance to speak. And um, Lara is going to be doing the timing and she'll let you know when you have 30 seconds to go. So at this time, are there any public comments? Good second, I've got one here. One here? Here. I can't see behind me. So okay, go ahead. And, uh, go ahead, Mark. So you're going to tell us your name and your title. Yeah, Mark Martini, which uh, uh, some of you may know that today the uh, House and Senate of Vermont legislature overrode uh, Governor Scott's veto H 887, which I hope everyone is just suggesting you might read it. Uh, I'm going to talk about one part of it that I know about. I'm going to let Ben talk about another part of the impact, because I think he knows it a little bit better than I do, but I'll comment afterwards. So we've always been up in the air about what our tax rates are going to be. So I, based on what the yield is, I'm going to throw this out there, and then you can please check me for it, uh, type of thing. So uh, this could be an equalized tax rate. It's going to be our spend per pupil, which is 16, 601, 15 divided by 98.93, which is the yield of the bill, which will now be in effect. And so that yields an equalized rate of 1.6781, take away the one cent discount, and we've got 1.6681 divided by the town CLA. So for Woodstock, our increase this year, we're not talking about the bond, is going to be 29.75%. Uh, for Plymouth, it's going to be, I have these numbers right, for Plymouth, it's going to be 35.58%. For Barnard, it's going to be 30.03%. For Bridgewater, 19.65%. Reading, 18.5%. And Pomford, I came up with 13.40%, but I'm not sure if that's correct because they had reassessed the last year. I'm using some of the numbers that you have gotten. So those are just rates. And that, that's with the passing, that's the yield, which is below the 10,250 yeah. you guys were counting on, which didn't happen. And then there's some other impacts of an excess spending penalty. I am not going to talk about that until I hear what you guys are planning to go forward with. If, if, if you're going to cover it, there's no reason for me to critique it at this point. I might critique it after I hear what you plan on doing. Uh, but, you know, I know you going forward, I think. If you had, if in the ideal world, if this was free, uh, option three is the only way to go. But we're not in the ideal world. And uh, some of these things that are going on, uh, the excess spending penalty for fiscal year 26 and 27, uh, Act 127, 5%, but that a lot of the calculations that you guys put on the website were well informed at the time you put them on, it, but they're not applicable anymore. I don't know if they're still up there. Because of the change. What is that? Exactly. So I'll talk about the other stuff that comes to present it. But those are the numbers that I've come up with. Uh, I'll let Tom uh, check them before they put them in the newspaper. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Anybody else? Yes. No, I'll stand up on them in the year. Apologize for not being here sooner, but I have a question for the, the board in general. Hey, could you say your name and tell me? Elvis Thompson Woodstock, class of 63. Uh, when this whole process started, there seems to be going on. I've seen a well drilled out here on the ball field. Nothing was ever said about that. Uh, my biggest concern is was this project put out to bid initially, or was it just handed to this? You know, all of it was in the paper. I have not seen it in a word that said that uh, there was a bid process on it. I'm curious. Yes, there was a bid. Yes, or no on that one. yes there's, there was a bid process. Why wasn't it published as so and so for this number of dollars per dollar? 
Well, it was publicized at our meetings for sure. Uh -huh. Probably in the minutes of the meetings, but we we spoke about it at the meetings. That should be public knowledge. But... It's in the minutes. That is public on the website. Mm -hmm. Anything you want to add to that, Ben? No, it was responsible there. Uh, responsible there. Uh, you know, on the work. All the process was required by law. Yes. Which bid are we talking about? If we're talking about the bid that I sat on the board with. But uh, can you make what I make it? My name is Jim Hatton with the town of Killington. So if we're talking about the bid from six years ago that brought Lee Sherwood in, let's remember the bid was won by a different company. That company went under, <laughs> Lee walked to another company, and then the contract was handed over to that company. So let's not say everything was done legal. I'm not gonna respond to that, thank you. I didn't think you were. Um, anybody else? I still have like two minutes left then. So, Lara, how uh, much time the do next, you have? The next, yeah, two and a half. Okay. The next question I have, which I'm not going to answer, but I believe we're around the time where contracts for teachers' contracts should be uh, figured out by now. We're also hearing that health insurance is somewhere again coming up in the next year 25, 10 to 18%, I believe. Can are we done with the teachers' contracts and what increase is that since health benefits and payroll is some 75% of our budget? I just feel that we're going to have another 15% like increase next year. Can Thank you. you. Yes, it's settled. Can you please answer what it's settled at? How much of the increase? It should be public. It is public. It was on, we voted at it at a meeting several months ago when it was settled. I think it was in April. Um, and uh, it's a range, uh, but it is essentially, as I recall, um, a seven and a half percent on um, the step increase. Thank you. Anybody online? All right, anybody else here? All right, thank you. Um, we are now going to have a student presentation. Um, Phoebe, if you'd like to come up to the table here, and I'm gonna let Elliot speak to um, what we're gonna be listening to. So uh, just to put this in context, um, the uh, policy committee has invited Phoebe back to uh, speak to us, and the policy committee has been working on a couple of policies related to curriculum, selection of material for the library, and uh, et cetera. And, uh, Coincidentally and fortuitously, um, Phoebe Anderson, who was a, a recent graduate for this weekend, uh, came to us a couple of months ago with a project she's been working on for the last year. And um, she presented to us uh, at our policy meeting last month, but uh, unfortunately, um, it was not a quorum meeting, so we don't have a recording of it, it wasn't submitted, and it was a powerful presentation. So um, we um, asked Phoebe to present it to the board. And she agreed, and considering that she just graduated, she'd still come back and thank you. And congratulations on your graduation, and thank you for that. Okay. Um, um, my name is Phoebe Anderson. I am, as you just said, I'm a recent graduate of Wasakian High School. So this past year, I did an independent study through the C3 uh, curriculum about developing a proposal policy to our school about Holocaust ed education in our school. Um, and I developed it about my um, due to my personal experiences of anti-Semitism, and then I noticed a rise of anti-Semitism anti throughout the country. And after researching more, I just thought it was very necessary to um, look into this um, policy for our school. Um, Holocaust education in schools shines a light on the impact of human behavior, which can um, which can impact communities. This moment in history demonstrates the power the dangerous powers of prejudice, discrimination, and dehumanization. There are many aspects of the Holocaust to be covered and studied. What relates to our current climate is how small actions lead to bigger things. 
And the academic portion of the policy is very important and students must be taught the historical facts of this event in history. However, along with teaching the historical facts, the policy is also about teaching humanity to students. Schools should be educating their students on how the history of anti-Semitism in the Holocaust is a really good example for this lesson. Even though schools may not teach the histories of discrimination towards the um, hate towards the Jewish people, it demonstrates how any form of hate can just become very powerful. And anti-Semitism, as I already said, is a rising problem in the US. Vermont specifically, our synagogues have constructed crash barriers, hired armed guards for high holidays, um, and more forms of protection just because we are trying to um, shield ourselves from the fear that we, we are faced with. Um, and teaching this to students can help um, as a reminder that we must prevent further persecution in our world today. So along with my project of researching just anti-Semitism, I specifically looked at the legislative legislator and policies that have been implement, implemented in Vermont. And unfortunately, Vermont is one of a couple states in the US with a pending or required Holocaust education. But recently, um, the bills that were being proposed this year, H-294 and S-87, were not voted on and did not get passed. So we do not have, again, Holocaust education requirement for the state of Vermont. And these bills were intended to require six hours of age and grade appropriate instruction for the Holocaust to be included through a union-wide curriculum each year from grades six through 12. And it's relevant to under for students to understand common themes of abuse of power, stereotypes, prejudice, hate crimes, and education is a key role in, um, in this strategy. These bills, um, as I said, were not passed, and Vermont is now the only New England state without Holocaust required education, which is very unfortunate. So. So one of the biggest parts of my project was researching the rise of anti-Semitism. And according to the Anti-Defamation League, the um, statistics are just increasing a lot, especially this last year, it had a 140% increase, um, which is very upsetting. And the year prior, there was 3,697 incidents reported, and that already had a really high increase with 36% uh, percent increase. And every year is just getting higher and higher. And one thing to know is that these are not all, these are what's being reported because it's what's being reported. So the statistics are obviously known to be a lot higher than what's happening. And so these statistics are already really alarming to people in the US. And then I also looked at, because I'm looking at policy for school, I looked at um, statistics for in-school anti-Semitic incidents. And 2023 one, I, have not found yet. I don't think it's been published quite yet, but the 2022 one did have a major increase. And as you can tell, 2020, 2021, 2022, it's just increasing throughout the years. And um, most of them are being um, harassment um, towards Jewish students. And unfortunately, as I said before, schools are very hard to pinpoint anti-Semitic incidents, especially if it's schools are not reporting it, and then it's not being noted in the news, it cannot be published for general knowledge. And so a lot of students may not feel comfortable to bring this up to their schools. And so a lot of it goes unrecognized. Mm -hmm. So as a student of Woodstock um, Union High School, I personally did not receive any education regarding the Holocaust. And I believe this lack of instruction allows for anti-Semitism to roam the hallways of our school. I personally see Nazi symbols drawn on desks, people, students delivering Nazi salutes, and another incident several years ago, which the school did confront, which was very nice, um, great of them to do, which involved a student drawing a swastika on their forehead. In my experience, yeah. if someone has dead, said, or done something um, anti-Semitic towards me, it's been followed with no offense, and <laughs> which still is not really, um, it's not really an apology. And if they feel the need to apologize for their actions, then they do have some understanding that what they're doing is offensive and, and anti-Semitic. But if they're not being taught the proper information to know what they are doing, they're more likely to become ignorant to the subject matter and it becomes hurtful 
Um, they'll make more hurtful decisions, such as drawing Nazi symbols in schools. And I don't think that we should normalize feeling unsafe when there's an opportunity to try and correct students' behavior, and so it doesn't lead to more anti-Semitism. If we can change and better the students' lives at Woodstock, we should take the opportunity. Anti-Semitism is a rising problem in the U.S. When I drive to High Holidays at our local synagogue, which is right across the street, I drive past the police guard um, who are posted outside of our um, synagogue, and I wave to them, and I know that they're there for our protection, but I still feel scared because I know that they have to be there to protect from people who would want to hurt my community. And the fact that anti-Semitism is still prevalent in our society creates an unsafe environment for Jewish Americans to express their culture and religion. Um, so our school, um, Westock Union High School, middle school, I believe that we should be implementing Holocaust studies into the curriculum to ensure that students are receiving an education regarding the history of and the impacts of anti-Semitism. In the wake of anti-Semitism, our school um, has made some positive changes regarding um, Holocaust education. Recently, the ninth grade class did um, have a field trip over to our synagogue and they spoke with a Holocaust survivor, which was really amazing. Um, but I do think this type of education must be Im implemented through a policy in order to prevent inconsistency in Holocaust education, making sure that we um, ensure that all students at Woodstock are learning about the important and rele relevant topic to become more empathetic citizens of the world. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phoebe. That was yeah. excellent. Thank you. So I just want to make thank you. Thank you. That was incredible. <laughs> um, I just want to mention as a pol as a policy committee, I think you know we haven't really discussed this formally, but um, I don't. I think our intention will be not to specifically write a policy about this, but to, our policy is gonna be about guidelines for developing it. But we would like, or I would like to ask for the um, board to consider empowering uh, the administration to look at the gaps in Holocaust education and maybe for, and so short of making a policy specific for it, but to look at the gaps in there and to try to fill in the gaps specifically because there is pending legislation that we're going to have to probably do this anyway in the next several years, hopefully. But um, I would, so that would be my request. I'll put it as a to empower the administration to look at the gaps and try to fill them. So you're making a recommendation. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Duly noted. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for taking the time. Great. All right, we um, have a policy to adopt. Elliot? Oh, the policy that we are adopting is, uh, this is uh, the capitalization of assets. Again, this is, I guess, the third time it's been presented and it's just critical for um, auditing, recording, and appropriately depreciating capital assets. So I'm asking to adapt, adopt that. Okay, is there a motion to um, adopt? So oh. Second. Who was the, who was the mover? <laughs> okay. Um, any discussion? All those in favor of adopting F23 capitalization of assets, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Approved. We also have a resignation to accept tonight. Uh, Patrick McDonough, who has been an elementary phys ed teacher at Woodstock Elementary for five years, has resigned. He's moving um, back to New Hampshire to be closer to family. And I guess this was his first five years of teaching, and he thanks the district for um, hiring him and giving him the opportunity to learn a lot and enjoyed his time here. So, Sure, I don't know him personally, but if you have or other parents who knew him, would yeah. like to say something? I mean, I think it's just he stepped into some really big shoes. You know, he took over for Cody when Cody moved into administration, um, and he never looked back. He brought in some very unique and exciting um, pieces of activities. Um, one of my favorite slides from the slideshow this year was his skateboard group at the K and pre-K level with the kids with the helmets was pretty exciting. But his energy, his his you know, he was always so positive and engaging. 
gave every student a chance. And from that, from the superintendent side, that's what I truly appreciated. He just, and, and during COVID, Patrick stepped into every single chair that was needed. He was subbing, he was taking temperatures. He was, you know, when we couldn't have a PE class, he was used in every single part of that building. So I saw him Friday night after dinner with his wife and Tony's always welcome back, but we'll miss them both. They're amazing educators and I just so enjoy them. Yeah, I just want to add, and he made a tremendous impact on uh, our kids. So much so that my son, Benjamin, who just left fourth grade at West, uh, he would wear a David Ortiz Red Sox t-shirt Mondays and Wednesdays because that's when he had PE and Mr. McDonough would call him Big Pop. <laughs> and he wore the shirt out like over several years. It was kind of funny, but yeah, I mean, he made, he was such a positive impact. Uh, on the school. Yeah, I'll add to that just an anecdote and the kind of uh, joy that he brought to the kids. Um, uh, kids in our neighborhood, you know, a lot of my kids are at West and uh, friends came over to play. We were playing a game with the ball. This is probably, I don't know, a year and a half ago. And one of the girls in the neighborhood, you know, kids aren't great with names, but she's just having a great time giggling, having this, playing this game. And she, she says, uh, she called me Mr. McDonough. Right, <laughs> which the association there is, you know, she's having an amazing time doing a physical thing, and like there's this, you know, positive uh, goal in her life, right? There's, uh, you know, so I was uh, never more happy to be confused with somebody. Like <laughs> so, um, is there a, a motion to accept with regret? So moved. Second. 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 All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you very much. We have three sets of minutes to approve on. I'd like to propose we do it as a group from May 6th, May 20th, and June 3rd. So um, could we have a motion to approve those three sets of minutes? So moved. Second. Thank you. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. All right. Um, okay, at this time, we'll move into our... Um, uh, scheduled discussion on our options and some decisions. At 6.52, I'd like to uh, think that we could do this within 45 minutes or so, depending on uh, the direction that it goes, so that we, we had a major discussion last two weeks ago. Uh, we've been talking about this for a long time. I think we're all pretty familiar with these options, and um, after that, we'll have public comment. So Ben is going to do a, a review here. Yeah, I'll take it from here. Uh, thanks, Gary. Um, so this format should look familiar to everybody. Um, I'm gonna run through a uh, an updated version of the deck that we went through uh, at the beginning of last month. we kind of go over the timeline, the process that we've been through, go through a summary of the options. You'll, these will look familiar. Uh, basically gonna be interspersing what you saw in uh, March with updates from the um, construction company and owner trucks that we got um, two weeks ago. Then we're going to provide a legislative update. Um, this is how the press is uh, going to do a little bit of uh, looking at the language that's in uh, the yield bill, um, 887, and uh, how that, um, it, uh, you know, the provisions that are going to have a significant bearing on our decision making. And then uh, tonight we're looking for decisions on an option uh, from the board and then a decision on uh, timing uh, for um, you know, when we may take that option forward to the voters and then talk about any next steps. So the, just to look again at the process that we've gone through as a board for kind of taking another look at these options. And this was you know, coming out of the bond vote in March and we did our the survey that got such amazing feedback and looked at that uh, feedback and realized that a, a lot of people in the public would like the board to go back and take another look at some of um, some of the alternatives to the new building. So this slide uh, should be familiar. This is pretty much beginning at uh, the start of April. There was a group that met weekly, the owner's reps, the architect, PC construction, school administration, and a couple of um, board members um, to you know uh, provide uh, context and direction to that that group and, and um, gather information. And uh, from there, we presented you know the prior version of this deck at the beginning of um, uh, May. That was the the meeting two meetings ago. We got the option to or the update from uh, PC uh, PCI sorry the owners reps uh, two weeks ago. 
over the past two weeks, we were looking for board members to engage members of the community on you know the the options and get uh, further feedback to inform a decision. And then tonight, the idea is to review uh, feedback and decision on desired options and the timing for a potential bond. So let's go through the options. Just a summary here again. Uh, the, the pros and cons. You'll see the materials that were presented, um, you know, six weeks ago and then uh, two weeks ago. First option is a is a renovation option. Um, this is the slide that was provided by um, our owners reps and uh, the construction company. And I think the big takeaway here on um, renovation would you know, everyone I probably from the survey feedback and anyone that we talked to, it's, you know, certainly the sentiment is certainly there's a way to do this cheaper. And can't we just rent it? It seems to be one of the top things that we've gotten kind of all along this process. Uh, but when costed out to be an apples to apples comparison for, you know, a building that could last 30 years, uh, an update of those systems, you know, you're looking at something that's, it's really comparable to building a new building. And a lot of that has to do with the soft cost of having, $10 million worth of temporary classrooms over a span of four and a half years, that timeline drives those costs up and drives the project costs up significantly. So while you know the construction cost, yes, is lower, the soft costs take it up to where it's you know in a similar range to, to the other um, the, the prior option. And you can see these were the pros and cons that we presented before. Here again, looking for something you know, potentially cheaper as a pro, but that just didn't bear out in the numbers that were provided by the professionals that were hired to work with us and provide real world numbers. Um, you know, it also was you know, confirming that that renovation option, I think it was uh, Marty Spaulding from PCI at our meeting two weeks ago, who said, yeah, we can, we can you know, renovate the building, we can um, give the, the building systems new life, put a new roof on the building, put new boilers in, those kinds of things, but there are some aspects of that building that are gonna be limiting in terms of the, from the life that we just can't do anything about. So com confirmation there, and then also, as I said before, you know, that long difficult project phasing and, and uh, cost kind of takes it into that, that range. Uh, the next option was the high school only option. And this was the sketch that Lavalley Brenzinger had done, right? So short term, new high school, uh, then in five or 10 years down the road, and the, the middle school, as you can see on the right half of the slide there. This is a slide we got from uh, PCI. And uh, as you can see, um, again, we were hoping for something that was you know, maybe 60 or $70 million for just that high school portion if you're building you know, 90,000 versus 158,000 square feet. But again, due to like a three-year phasing, uh, some of the, the soft costs involved with meeting the brain um, extend the life of the, the middle school building, those soft costs come in around 15 million. So here again, while the construction estimate was, yes, cheaper than the new build, those offsetting soft costs drive it up to, yes, cheaper than the, the new building, but you're only getting half of what you, you know, had, had taken the voters previously. So looking at something in the $92 million range. Um, so yeah, um, that's kind of an update to those pros and cons, and that, uh, you know, that phasing and, and um, uh, disruption kind of thing. Um, the third option that we talked about was the, the new bill. We had two versions of this. The, the version essentially that we took to the voters with uh, you know, a year's worth of escalation. And sure enough, this is 105 million, 5% um, uh, escalation applied on, on you know, a $99 million project that's ready to come out. Um, the second version of this was, well, what cuts do we make to try to get it within, you know, kind of keep it at the same price that um, the voters had seen previously? And so uh, you, you lop, you know, 8,000 square feet off of this option as part of value engineering, you start to see impacts to um, program, right? So like uh, the wing that gets impacted from the prior version, you can see up on the, if you make a look at that picture, is that half of that wing that we already lopped half of it off, you take that out and that's you know, unified arts. So language and visual arts um, is looking for a home at that point, right? So, um, and then, uh, yeah, so the updates there, looking at, uh, oops, I got a typo there, that's 105, uh, this oops, is the update uh, for the, what the voters have already voted on. Again, it's a tough sell, given the fact that you know, voters uh, have already voted on that and, and didn't like it um, in March. 
Um, okay, so at this point, I will move before we you know, start discussions of you know, which of those options um, up to a legislative update. And this is, um, like I said, hot off the presses. Uh, this draft language has been out for a few weeks, so I think a lot of a number of people who follow these things closely are familiar with them, but there may be board members who haven't had a chance to read it. But I'll give you a summary of what um, uh, 887, the yield bill, is, is essentially doing. So the first thing that has been talked about for about a year, um, those board members who've been around for a while may recall that there was a thing called the excess spend threshold or penalty phase. And that is, it, it comes from this, uh, the idea that we all share tax revenues with the, into the centralized education fund and tax rates are set uh, based on how many students you have, your, your equalized um, pupil count. Um, that shifted with Act 127 this year and there was supposed to be a moratorium that continued on that. It started in the pandemic, the, the moratorium, um, that is a penalty phase whereby if you exceed a number set annually by the state, then anything you spend for people over that gets uh, counted double for purposes of setting your tax rates, right? So that's very difficult to pass a school budget if you're in that phase because you're essentially you know, well over statewide averages for, for spend. So that's coming back and it's coming back in FY26. So not for this next year, this won't be something that saves money for uh, the tax rates that we're talking about uh, coming up in the, in the very next year, um, but it'll be coming back for FY26. And along with that, and I think one of the uh, biggest surprises here, and something that I struggled to get an answer from our legislatures on, was, uh, and this is going to be a little bit of a mouthful, so I've simplified it to call it safe harbor for approved uh, school construction projects. Essentially, um, when you're calculating your education spending for purposes of that excess spend threshold, uh, for as long as I've been involved with the board, and probably a long time before that, approved school construction project spending was excluded from that calculation, right? So if you pass a bond and you're paying your principal and interest on those bond payments, that doesn't count against you. You don't get double counted against that. The legislature decided to do away with that um, exemption. And I'll show you where that, um, uh, or that, that exclusion. And it leaves us in a position where if we were to pass a bond before uh, more steps are taken, uh, we'd essentially be in penalty phase for the entire amount that we begin spending, right? So let's say there was uh, someone at our last board meeting in the library who said, uh, I know you don't understand, we just want to have like a 40 or $50 million option, right? And tell us what we can get for that. Well, if we took that approach at $50 million, we essentially have the same impact as a $100 million bond, right? Because all of that would be, you know, ostensibly in penalty phase since we're likely to make us get the current bond. Can I ask you to clarify that? So what's the difference between the, the hypothetical bond you're talking about, the 40 or $50 million, and the $100 million? Yeah, if you pass the, you pass the $100 million bond, you, your voters be on the hook for it. In fact, of a $200 million, right? Because the legislature has done away with this safe harbor. It, it used to count against you. It used to be a penalty phase. It wasn't double counted your approved school construction costs, mm -hmm. right? So that's why I make the comparison. So in any bond has any any bond you know put, puts you correct. Up. Let me show you the language. But the impact sense. would be uh, the impact of the I guess the penalty would be different depending on the size of the bond. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And how much school spending that you're you're engaged in. So let me um, just pull this up so you can see. Um, this is a, a deep dive into. Um, uh, statute, so everyone try to stay away. Um, here we go. Uh, so what used to be in the law, right, and this is here, it's the definition of education spending, um, says how much the school district budget, um, and, you know, some other things that are essentially, you know, what's what your school budget com is comprised of, and then there's some exclusions. One of the things that was, that was exciting for kind of a new bill group for a long time is the fact that fundraising was excluded, and that was something that you know, discussions with AOE we were able to confirm that our capital campaign wouldn't be counted against them. So that's not education spending if you're raising private dollars to pay for your school budget. So that's right there in the law. But then what's um, been in the law for a long time is you know, these things that uh, for purposes of calculating excess spending, um, education spending shall not include improved school capital construction, right? And there's a 
several different versions of this because there's different ways you can get approval. But what the legislature's done is they've gone back um, and, excuse me, and they pack all that out. So the only, what the language says now is for all bonds approved by voters prior to July 1st, 2024, that's in 13, 14 days, uh, voter approved bond payments towards principal and interest shall not be included in education spending for purposes of calculating and spending. I suspect that that's there as like a grandfather, right? Like Burlington passed their bond a um, year and a half ago. So, you know, they'll continue to see their principal and interest payments be excluded from calculation of excess spending. But a bond that was passed in, um, you know, uh, after this kind of new deadline, you know, would, would be subject to um, excess spending. So that's a pretty significant development in terms of the um, assumptions underpinning you know, our, our project. Um, the next thing that you see in the law, and this is where you, there's a couple things that are potentially encouraging, is the creation of a commission on the future of, of public education. And so the legislature, as anybody who follows this stuff knows, loves these studies, right? These, these commissions. I think somebody said that like since um, 2000, there's been something like 38 different studies commissioned for education alone, right? But we have the latest one. And this is one that is supposed to, uh, you know, pick up where the school construction aid task force left off. You might remember us talking about newer and fewer. That came from the school construction aid task force in February when they provided the report to say, um, yeah, the, the vision for education buildings in Vermont uh, is, you know, newer buildings, uh, fewer locations, right? And so um, they're supposed to pick up on that work and then. Uh, one of the interesting things is you know, have to look at a, a number of different things because it's really this um, you know, crisis around tax rates that you know, the legislature is attempting to address. So they're taking a holistic look at the entire education spending uh, uh, formula and system. Um, but one of the things that they've specifically been tasked with is uh, recommending locations and sizes of school buildings. Right, and I'll show you where this is in the language as well. So let's say, so yeah, so you see, you know, this, um, uh, the, the uh, mandated things that the, um, uh, they have to, in, the, in developing recommendation, commission shall consider and prioritize the following topics, right? And so one of these things you see is the, uh, analysis and recommendation for the most efficient and effective number and location of school buildings, school districts, and supervisory unions needed to achieve Vermont's vision for education. And then if there's a recommendation for any changes, they need an implementation plan. So uh, in terms of timing, so this particular commission has been tasked with um, two deadlines by the end of um, this year, if it's um, December 15th, they're supposed to provide recommendations for near-term savings across the uh, education funding system. And then a year after that, they're supposed to provide like a comprehensive, you know, what's the future of the public education in Vermont. So it's pretty sweeping and it looks like the legislature is you know, teeing up potentially, you know, a, a major move, right? What does that mean? I have no idea. You yeah, try to have conversations with the a legislator and it's hard to get a sense of, um, you know, the uh, you know, any kind of master intent that's guiding all this, but um, maybe uh, they'll be looking at, you know, this shared resource system, Act 60 itself, right? Is this working? Um, who knows? But uh, that's that's where we are. So I, I bring all that up um, because it's, it's absolutely relevant, right, in terms of a project like ours. Um, and the, um, I, I think the idea is when we, we tee all of this up, right? The timeline was such that we come out of the bond mode in March, and a lot of the feedback we got on the yes side was we know this is only getting more expensive. So let's, you know, let's let's move forward with the project. If you know, it seems clear. Um, and then you know, what we didn't know that is you know, just a few weeks later, nearly April, the legislature would be doing away with the, you know, that safe harbor for, for school construction bonds, right? So it would have been nice had someone let us know that that was going to be going into law just a few months, like you know, three months after our bond vote. So we could have said to the voters, hey, this is our last chance, maybe for a very long time, to pass the school bond without having it be double, double impacted, right? Now, there is uh, some, some reason for optimism, some discussions that I've had say, and I don't want to get too far into the weeds, 
But one of the um, criticisms of the bond, and this happened, you, you see this in the news in like Stowe and other places where bond votes have failed, is that the um, is that second homeowners um, don't have to pay their fair share, right? Like that's a that's like a um, it, it's not it's not actually the true second homeowners do contribute, but they contribute as the entire set, right? They don't get affected by local spending decisions of the school district, so. You know, one school district passing a bond, right, is not going to affect the eight, you know, the pool of eight hundred million dollars that gets raised from your non-homestead tax break, right? So the idea is that um, potentially the reason for making these initial changes to, you know, the the funding system is to make school construction aid what we call categorical aid. And that's the same thing as like special education funding, money that. That isn't considered education spending at the district level, right? And that would be amazing, right? If the state were to take that step and say, yeah, we're saying who can have a school and who can't. So we're also going to make make it so that your um, primary homeowners don't get crushed by uh, you know passing these bonds, right? It's, it's been a problem for a long time. That's one kind of theory, that's one kind of push. There's a member of the joint fiscal office that prepared you know presentation materials on this concept. But that, at this point, it's, it's all it is, it's a concept. It is something that I think we can get behind and push where we know there's going to be, uh, for instance, um, let me just go to this slide on the next SLFS for a little bit. So the uh, commission report, I'm oh, sorry, this is the commission report, it was September 15th, this is the next kind of thing that's supposed to come out, is you know a formal written work plan, which will include a communication plan to maximize public engagement on and for September 15th, uh, 2024. So that's just a few months away. And so it looks like they're looking for you know lots of voices. And this is something that you could you know, really get behind. Chris, this is, I know you and I have talked about advocating for making construction spending categorical, right? Versus, versus local school district spending. I think that's something that we, as a board, could could very much send a message on. You know, kind of depending on our action tonight or in uh, in future sessions. Um, and I'll come back. Uh, well, I'll just finish the slide. So this is that December fifteenth date. It's the written report containing preliminary findings, recommendations, uh, including short term cost containment considerations for the FY twenty five legislative session. And that's um, and then a year after that is the written report. With the final findings, recommendations for the statewide vision of Vermont's public education system mm -hmm. policy changes. Okay, so you know, kind of what was, yeah, Elliot. So, is the whoever's doing this, the task force, whatever, are they interviewing everybody who's like on deck in the school? I mean, how are they? What do they know about? What's, what's the process? Yeah, yeah. Are they getting input from you all? Uh, no, I mean this is this is this is legislation at this point, right? So, um, the if you take a look at the statute, you'll see the composition of that commission, right? And there's you know members like the a member from the Vermont uh, Superintendents Association, Principals Association, School Boards Association, right? The Secretary of Education. Um, so you know people who you know a lot, right, ostensibly. And then there's a set number of uh, meetings that they need to have um, on a particular timeline, right? But in terms of what they do with their time, I think that's TBD, right? Who I mean, they're gonna consult with, right? Yeah. Yeah. But we can certainly, you know, uh, send messages and, and make noise where you're, you're seeing um, moves at the state level that have, you know, potentially massive impacts to, um, you know, our ability to make decisions at the local level. My retirement plan is to attend these meetings. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, with all that as as background, I know that that's you know pretty significant um, developments. Um, you know, the, when we we teed up this meeting, it was for the uh, the purpose, and you're not knowing that these developments were coming, of being able to potentially go to a bond vote in September. We can't do that. That's absolutely not an option because it's just too much risk. There's too many unknowns. That bond vote would fail massively, would waste everybody's time, money, and energy, right? So I think where we are, whatever you know, option that we we decide is, you know, um, potentially sometime after September, right? It could be a special if, if some of these um, you know the developments come through, could be next town meeting day, right? So timing is probably the thing that's um, you know the most uncertain, but I do think there's value in a couple of ways in the board at least continuing to engage with our communities and engage as a group in you know formulating what we believe the, the best option should be right so um you know in, in whether even with the, the timing aspect being open 
So I guess what I'd like to do is, um, and this is you know, relatively informal, but just take a, a straw poll if we can, and maybe um, you know, just to start the conversation about you know having been through you know two or three meetings now, look, looking at survey results, having been through you know the bond process itself, and the information that we've gotten from the architects, just by show of hands where people are with the different options. Right. If we could do that, you might want to get out of that so we can oh, see sure. the board members. Yeah. Can I? I don't want to disrupt that flow necessarily, but I've got a question just that I feel like I'll forget. Yeah. <laughs> Specifically related to this um uh piece about the no safe harbor um. Just so I understand, um, the just as a you know, hypothetical, were we to pass a bond next year mm -hmm. um, uh, for a new building, payments don't start for three years on that right. bond. So is it three years later than that? It's not the bond amount, it's the payments on the, the bond where that, that piece will kick in. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. That's pretty hugely for pay. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, 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 for sure. So, I mean, but it's a, it's a great point. And that was one of the things that with all of these, you know, this mass escalations in property value and, um, you know, the kind of political football and school spending has become at the state level this year. That was one of the things that was uh, we were attempting to provide voters assurance in the run-up to the bond in March, just to say, well, look, three years, you know, in terms of a grace period, we called it, will enable you know, voters to kind of catch their breath and some of these things to, to settle. And it'd be great if we kind of could rely on structure being in place at that time. But you know, I don't know, I have a hard time believing that uh, anybody could, you know, just take that leap of faith, right? Gosh, that's it. Just by the way I'm looking at it, I mean, it makes a difference on what happens at the state level for the option as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, if the state level comes in and actually says, hey, we're going to do ed funding, which the way I look, when, I, when I say building funding, I'm saying as a whole, like you were saying with non homestead taxpayers, like that obviously makes the decision different than if it's individual district funded. Yeah, yeah it goes down to so the money we have to honest, work. Exactly. Honestly, the, the, the option all depends on. This, what the state decides to do for funding this. Mm. So the state says, hey, we're gonna we're gonna fund it statewide for the project, then the new bill's the obvious choice. Right. It may be even a different option, right? Right. You can say to yourself, well gosh, if the state's picking up the tab, right? Well, it's, it's, or some of the tab, yeah. We'll have to see. So, so, just an idea. But the three dates that you listed when they have to come back with a report, mm -hmm. are any of those three more um, profound in what we might hear as far as information? It's interesting. Yeah, I think the, the thing that I see as being the most significant is when are they going to identify a funding source, right? And so um, I can throw it back up on the screen here in a moment, but when the school construction aid task force met, they recommended a deadline of January 1st, 2025, to identify a funding source for school construction aid. And it looks like the legislature's next move was to kick that can down the road to the end of 2025, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that, I mean, that's the most meaningful thing, right? If that's, is that the timeline? That's a year and a half away, right? And you know, two more legislative sessions. And meanwhile, you know, we've got, you know, honey trucks showing up to keep the, um, keep the plumbing system. Right, so it's 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 frustrating, that, but that's kind of been the mo at the state level for a very long time. I don't know. Sorry, that's a very depressing answer. To the, to I mean, there's but, not much joyful things coming out of this, so it's yeah. added to the pile. Yeah, right. Well, I but, think another one of the significant things is that that locations, if they yes, decide right. that Woodstock is a location, then yeah. we have a great case. Yeah, if absolutely. they say no, we don't need one in the middle of the state, yeah. we'll just bus kids for two hours, then uh, we don't have a leg to stand on anymore. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting though, because you think about that and it's like, like, is it a chicken and egg sort of thing where they've already given us the preliminary approval, right? And so let's say we marshal the political mm -hmm. will among our voters and get that approved. Are they gonna reverse course at that point once we start construction and say, oh no, that's not a good location. It seems unlikely. 
seems more likely if they were going to do that, it would be in the, in the absence of that, right? Well, and it seems like if they, um, I mean, I'm, I'm an optimist, so I, I agree with that, but it, it also seems like once they choose those locations, uh, you know, assuming, you know, they've got this, they've got a lot of power right now and yeah. say we're chosen, that, that would be great. Um, they're also going to, I wouldn't think then they're going to continue to penalize us for the construction, for any construction costs that we do as a district have to um, put into that school. Um, I mean, maybe they maybe they would, but I mean, it, I can't imagine that if they're saying they want newer schools, and these are the places they want them, but and and you know we'll fund some of it, but we're gonna you know penalize you for for getting behind it and, and funding what you know, what the local district needs to fund. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah, it seems like there's more that needs to be done. It's frustrating that without like a comprehensive approach on um, school funding, they couldn't just leave this public alone so that school districts could continue right. you know, the work that we've been doing. Um, but it, it is in essence of a moratorium mm -hmm. on bonds, mm -hmm. right? So, so it is, yeah. Just to add to the conversation, <clears throat> this hub school idea is not new. I mean, yeah. Secretary French, always wanted to have one superintendent for the entire state of Vermont. So this is not a new drumbeat. This is an intention that we've been operating under for a long time. We've always known that if they're going to select schools, they're going to look at our test scores. They're going to look at our offerings. They're yeah. going to look at our curriculum. They're going to look at our post-secondary outcomes. You know, all the indicators. We have 20 towns already sending to this high school. So we known this since Dan met with us many years ago as a board and that there's at some point they're going to look around the state and say who are our highest functioning high schools who are our highest functioning school districts and where do they are they located and mm -hmm. so we've been operating with that kind of threat dark cloud overhead and 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 marching towards how do we become one before we're designated one so I, I think that the idea that hub school is new is not. It's been around for at least fifteen years. Yeah. yeah um, so just to kind of, um, I and feel free. I took my screen share off, but I, I do think it'd be good to get a sense, just kind of where individual board members stand. And if what you just heard kind of puts you in a position where you know an option doesn't make sense to you, then you know don't don't vote on an option. But I guess just by a show of hands. At this point in time, like who would uh, be behind given the information that we've got with option number one, the renovation option? Can we have more discussion? Oh, yeah, we will. This is like official. This is like awful just to get a sense of like kind of what people people are saying. I mean, can we have more discussion before we do this trouble? Oh, or sure. Do we need the discussion after that? Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm just trying to get a sense of where people are. Mm -hmm. right? But if that feels like an improper question, then I'll yeah. that, that just the discussion is like a hard question. And that's all just because. It, that that question that that's going to depend on the state's action mm -hmm. to to make that decision. Because if we choose, if we were saying like vote wrong for one, and then they decided they're going to do put it through as a statewide bond, but no bill, so it's going to be spread over the entire state. Then the tax impact to each individual, especially in our community, is going to be less. So then three would be the one that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So and not one. So I think it's just part of a question to ask, but I get what you're doing. Yeah, we have a question from Adam as well. Yeah, go for it. Adam. Uh, actually, just um, a response to what I hear is kind of a hypothetical, right, Ben? Is that uh, um, you know what I see really gets kind of taken off the table, or even more challenging is the idea of a renovation. If we're look, we're we're kicking the can down the road, essentially, you know, as per the state's you know moratorium. So we're you know we're struggling to keep the school afloat for how many more years until it's determined how we're going to and pay for any new form of construction so in the meanwhile we're trying to keep the school afloat and um you know it just the the feasibility of let's do let's renovate something that's already aging and falling apart seems to be uh, taken off the map in my opinion thanks Adam. Hey, do we want to just like um I guess maybe go through the different options and get board member feedback. I mean, is that a, a more a better use of our time this evening? 
Sam? Yeah, I think maybe that sounds good. Um, I mean, what I was just going to add to the conversation is, you know, I think one of the big takeaways I took from the last meeting was the responsibility we have to not asking our community to take on a bond for the cost of something that we don't know the lifespan of, mm -hmm. right? So one of the big things that, you know, I'm concerned about is, okay, if we we ask for a bond for something for the renovation and, you know, there are structural things or other things that were brought about in that meeting and about that, you know, okay, well, you might only get another this many years it might not even last the age of the bond. Yeah. Um, and I, I, my, that was a big takeaway for me of how, like, do we really want to be asking, you know, our community's potential grandchildren to be paying on a bond that is a building that's gone because <laughs> it, it didn't last. So that was one of the things that, and that being said, I don't think our taxpayers and communities should have to pay for it all. I really feel strongly that on a state level, they need to, they need to step up. It's not. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Well, and yeah. actually having well, yeah, go for it. Yeah, I just wanted to say, like, I think the point about the renovation seeming hard, like a hard sell is a fair one, but uh, across the other options, it's just really hard, we, you know, the without much community input. And I would love to have a more detailed plan on how we're going to get significant community. I mean, I know there was a survey and there were, but it feels like we just need a little bit more so that whatever bond vote we go to at whatever juncture, there's just been a lot more feedback from the community and that people feel like they've been brought along more. So I'm hesitant to even stake out a position on even in an informal way today when I feel like I haven't heard from the, the folks in the community. Sure, that's fair. Yeah, it's today, right, that the yield bill uh, got um, the, the override of the governor's veto. So uh, all of the feedback that I've gotten in Bridgewater um, has been all around the renovations, not surprisingly. Um, and so I think if we're going to choose to wait, which I agree with, um, maybe we could use that time to explore the renovation options some more and provide some more answers and some more um, detail for people who've had questions. So, uh, for example, the renovation that was proposed includes a lot of things that aren't specifically fixing building to keep it going. So uh, there was questions about, well, what would it cost really just to fix something long enough for the building to last 10 years or 20 years. I realized, I understand why they chose to um, put together a proposal for 50 years. So it was apples to apples, but I think people were not looking for apples to apples. They were looking for options that had different price points um, and they didn't get it. So now they want it. <laughs> and I, I was wondering if maybe we could go back to option number one and strike out everything that is necessary for the next 10 years, um, 20 years, whatever. Uh, there was also questions about um, the renovations getting bid upon. Uh, the new build was bid out um, to three different clicks. We got bids. Um, but as far as I can tell, this, this option number one was just created by one company. It wasn't I mean, the, the board voted on the, the you know the new build option we've taken the um, you know to the voters um, <clears throat> you know, last year's town meeting day um, the 1.65 million dollars to you know, um, take that design work far enough along and bring on the, the um, construction going for the new build right so it wasn't it, the, the we certainly you know used private funding to bring on the architect to um, you know do that design and that was the first time that we were using. Um, you know, the, uh, all the funding for the, the project, but it was decided by the board before we brought on the construction. Company. Right, right. Um, and that's when we were moving forward with the new build. Then it got voted down, and now we're going back to the drawing board. I'm, but I'm kind of thinking we're not completely going back to the drawing board because we aren't remitting the renovation. Oh, I see, because we're using, yeah, because PC construction 
they used about half of their funding to do the value engineering session in March. Yeah. And so we were using the um, you know, the rest of that money to you know develop pricing for some of these other options to the right. extent that we could. Right? Right. So, but I see where you're coming from. Say if we were to go back out, maybe a different firm would be more appropriate than PC. Right. And there was there was a lot of people who um, were thinking local contractors. Um, so that was a big passion for um, people. And then um, one question that I have, because I've never built a school before. Um, so I understand how a building could fail if the systems fail, if heating fails or water or sewer or whatever. But if those all get repaired, how does the building still fail? Like, is the roof going to fall in? Is a wall going to fall off? Is, you know, we're going to wake up one day and it turns into a pile of Thanos dust? I mean, like, what does building fail look like? Do we have, um, uh, we'd asked Marty and um, some of the Kurt's names. Kurt to, to be on tonight uh, in case questions like this came up that we need somebody in this industry to answer for us. Um, I guess I'm here, was, Ben. Okay, great. Marty, you, you gave an answer to that two weeks ago. I think you talked about, but I tried to paraphrase you earlier in the meeting tonight, but do you want to uh, maybe answer that one? Yeah, I can take a stab at that. So as we indicated, you know, most of the building systems would, would get replaced as, as, you know, as you would in a new new build, but the, the things that would be remaining are like the, the the foundations. Those are existing foundations that are you know 40, 50 years old. I, I assume that they may not ha uh, you know be built to the today's standard. They may not have a a vapor barrier or proper insulation underneath that insulation. So those things just won't be constructed the same as when when building new. Doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna fail in 10 years, but you could have other uh, issues with those things that come up before that same 30 year year period of time. Uh, and, and, you know, that goes into a lot of other infrastructure. Um, like, you know, the assumption would be to replace most of the, the plumbing, but maybe not all of the plumbing. So again, you could have some things fail sooner rather than later. Um, so, so hopefully that answers the question about the longevity of the of the renovating the existing building but i do want to also speak to the um being able to make a less of an investment into those renovations one of the challenges there is that you have to bring everything you touch you have to bring up the current code you have to meet the energy code you have to meet ada compliance um you have you have to meet um all the new electrical co codes so it's it's difficult to do like uh you, you know less of an investment um into those renovations without uh you know being forced to bring the building up to that current code and that's where the costs come in on the renovation options. Uh -huh. Yeah, I was just going to bring up that that nothing that the state the dust the state has raised impacts in my mind which of these options is the best one? It just doesn't impact them. Um, 3B stood on its own before we brought it to bond. It's still the best option. Um, as was just stated, use, short of just waiting for systems and parts of the school to fail and fixing them in an emergency mode, short of doing that, anything you touch needs to be brought up to code, which is why the renovation is, is, is not the best option. It's going to cost more. So I understand that we're kicking the can down the road and it, it upsets me, but an informal poll Lydia and I took in our town, Pompro, we were in favor of 3B, flat out. The only reason it didn't pass was because one, maybe two towns voted it down we'd have been off and running now. But in my mind, 3B is still the best option. Maybe too expensive, but it's still the best option. Yeah, Bob, are you talking about the, the $100 million option or the $105 million option that I just ran through? The one that went to the voters already or the value engineered version of that? Well, either one. The, the value engineering has brought the cost down somewhat with, without huge programmatic changes. But pick either one. The, the costs of all the options are going to continue to rise as we go forward. Right. But 
But yeah, either one. The original one would be fine with me. It's too expensive. We understand it's too expensive. But short of, you know, just building a much smaller school, I'm not sure we have uh, many options left now. Let's let's pivot that then. And if, uh, and if this is torturous, you guys, anybody can make a motion to call the question and we can wrap this up. But um, the uh, let's talk about the second option. Is anybody um, you know, building the high school alone? Anna, you had some feedback, you know, at the meeting two weeks ago. Is there anybody who thinks that's an approach that, you know, because the idea there is that you could potentially stage the project, make it more affordable in the short term, you know, as you kind of continue that. Or is that attractive to anybody or is the overall cost in, in say 10 years time, you know, uh, does that kind of sink that one? I'll say it was it was attractive to me until I saw the write-up of it. Um, I thought it was a really good compromise. Um, and then, you know, again, seeing the, the money is, yes, it's cheaper in the beginning, but if I'm using my personal finances, I mean, we're all taxpayers in, in this district, right? So whatever we do is gonna affect all of us too. We're not um, safe for that. Um, but if I'm gonna invest my personal tax dollars, I wanna do it right the first time and not waste, I don't know if waste is the right money, but use my monies for extra labor hours. So I concur with what Bob said. Um, I have more detailed ideas about 3A versus 3B, but um, I was really excited about option two. And then I saw it and realized that that was not the best use of money. And it's not the best for our staff and it's not best for our students. So it's, to me, it's not the best option. Other thoughts or did that kind of get it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think that really wraps it up for me too. I mean, that in theory, the second option is like, okay, yeah, that's a great compromise, right? And then you look and you're like, oh, wait, we're, the majority of the budget is going towards a much more extended build out that we're then going to pay a lot more in labor costs. Yeah. You know, um, that's why, I mean, anyone who does any kind of build out has ever done anything else, you know, you're going to close, you're going to, you know, I, I close the cafe for like a week. I do all my building in that week mm -hmm. rather than trying to get it done over a course of how many months and, and hey, staff have to run around. Yeah, the staff has to run around, it affects business, it affects right. the customer. Like, I mean, it's just, I mean, I, it's a silly, you know, it's much different costs, but that's just where my brain goes. Josh? Sure. Just to touch on one of the um, things Laura had written down, there is a group of local contractors that would be interested in doing a walk through. I, I don't know if that's that's something that you and I can set up set up to give them the chance to do the walkthrough just to see where that number comes in to play or what they have to offer as local contractors. Maybe that's just a motion that may help. Yeah, I think the most, behind. I think the most significant takeaway um, this evening so, is that we've got more time than yeah, we did before. Yeah. Unfortunately, the meter's running, right? Um, no matter what we do, but this isn't going to be a September thing. So, um, uh, are we one of the, I guess one of the significant points that uh, something to think about as board, and I don't know if tonight is the night that we do this. Maybe this is too much to process as a group. But um, the um, there were a lot of people. Like you went to the, we were tracking like the web traffic on the website, right, for the project, uh, and it was just getting more and more. We're like, holy crap, like what's going on? And we realized that a lot of other school districts, administration, people who were trying to do similar things around the state were watching us, mm -hmm. right? And in that, one of the kind of um, <clears throat> silver linings, and, uh, and, you know, one of the byproducts of kind of the, the buzz that we generated was actually a little bit of an old boost, right? Where other school districts in our area, right? Whether it's like Choice Town, like Weatherfield, for instance, where you see a, a big uptick of, of enrollment from Weathersfield where we hadn't seen them past. And it's schools and, and people in those choice towns saying like, hey, this is a school district who's prioritizing school construction and you know education versus like trying to pack it up, right? So one of the thoughts is that there is value in picking an option, whatever it is, right? Just to message you know that commitment to people who may be looking, right? And it's not just enrollment, it's teachers who may be trying to recruit, it's people who work here already and go to school here already to, to, to show that commitment, right? But I don't know. Um, it feels like the way the discussion is going is that we're 
not really you know stack hands on the paper option. So, so um, my opinion is I think one of the three, three A and B, is probably the most forward looking, and even though it's more, probably in the long run, it's probably the most value. But mm -hmm. I mean, it's a lot. But I do have a question just in terms of where we are right now. So, sure. in terms of excess spending, can we not even? I mean, wouldn't we be excess if we spent twenty million? I mean, wouldn't we? Be yeah, over? yeah, we'll be looking to make right. cuts, right? This is a discussion that we had at the finance committee meeting a couple of weeks ago when the, the yield bill came out, right? And this is, you know, a result of, of look, we've got how many AP programs, Sherry? <laughs> I mean, well, forty-five percent of our students at the high school are enrolled in an AP class, right? We've, we've got, got pre, twenty different. AP classes. We've got pre-K at every elementary school, and we're one of the only school districts in the state that does that, right? And three-year-old pre-K students only count for half. So on a per pupil spend, we get crushed by those kinds of things. But we're trying to be responsive to the needs of our school community, right? So we're on the high side, and we'll be looking to make cuts. We've got some great ideas. We think about how we can do that without you know dramatically impacting programming, but it, it's very likely to be painful. You know, now that this is coming through. Um, I don't know, Sherry. I'm uh, sorry, uh, Sherry. Um, do you? Uh, where... oh, my life has been called Sherry. Because <laughs> of my twins, Mr. Sherry. Yeah. I guess where, where do we want to go? I've, I've given my presentation. We've had the discussion. Um, we want I to, mean, my it, sense in hearing this discussion is that everyone's leaning towards the third option mm -hmm. and that the first and the second for their various reasons are not uh, good options because both of them are kicking a can down the road, if you will, yeah. that, with the middle school. So I don't know. I uh, Yeah. I don't know if there are other folks online who haven't spoken yet who would like to speak up to this. Anyone else here who would like to weigh in? Corinne? Um, I, I'm i torn between this, this idea of, you know, sort of like not continuing to stall or kick the can and sort of, you know, maybe sort of sending this message that like we understand that this is that you know one of the options three one of the op yeah three a or three b is likely the best option and this this other poll which is the idea that um I, I think there was a good amount of frustration and I mean I, personally as well but amongst you know community members with the idea that like you know the three options that were presented two weeks ago are are actually the three options, right? So there's there's this sort of background of sort of distrust of what's right, you know, of the process. Yeah. And um a couple of the things, I mean, I have a like a list of like a few things that I think we need as a board to develop our understanding of and develop our idea, uh, you know, our ability to convey um to the voters or, or be part of the conversation. Um one of which are things that we don't really know, we don't have like super hard data on, but what data do we have on sort of these shifts in enrollment that are starting to happen, may happen, you know, we've heard that there's, you know, new bus routes, there's only, can we consolidate some of this data and sort of have it down, um, you know, what increases have we seen in enrollment, what is possible given the context of what's going on, you know, in Weathersfield or some of these other places. Um, any info we have on this idea that like, it seems anecdotally that Woodstock is in a good position, you know, relative to this, to this question of like, oh, if they were to choose a hub, you know, what are the, you know, why would, why should we think that Woodstock will be one and not be one of these other things? Um, but also just in terms of like the options, um, you know, we're looking at three round about $100 million options and choosing amongst them is it, kind of like, it doesn't, it's, you know, it's not much of a choice. So we need to be able to understand, okay, doing nothing or just being able to maintain what we have over the next 10 years, what does that cost us? My understanding is it's going to be like 17, 18 million dollars. What is the tax impact of that? You know, because that might be very different than what people understand. You know, just sort of this waiting and seeing. 
you know, what is what is the actual impact of, impact of that um, to, you know, people's property tax bill? Because I think when you see that, you know, what you get by waiting and spending, you know, a, what, what is that, a, between a tenth and a, a fifth, you know, an eighth or something of the, of the costs on a bond, the tax impact isn't that much less. You know, it isn't only an eighth of what you would be paying because of lots of other um, pieces of the financial picture that, that come in there. So we need to be able to spell that out so that we understand it completely and so that we can also convey that in our conversations with the community. So I feel like it's most important for us to move ahead and be, you know, while, while sort of signaling more broadly, politically is important, um, waiting and having more discussions with our communities with some of these pieces in place um, is really important on our on our local level to actually be getting something passed when we all sort of say, this is what we think we want to pass. Everybody needs to be on the same page and that trust kind of needs to be built by us putting a little more time into um, fleshing out some of those pieces to the best of our ability. Sam? Was it all? Oh, no, it was Laura. Laura. Can we create an option 3C, which is the value engineering, but not the flat roof? Because I don't think people were so <laughs> 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 that didn't get as much, right? You know, it was interesting. Like, we had to do so much drainage, you know. Yeah, to exactly. Take care of the... I don't think it saves anything. Yeah, and we're really I think it's yeah, yeah, people who philosophically approach the yeah. to flat roofs are all... I, I personally was like, yeah, could we just do this and still have a slanted roof? Because physically, like, where my brain was spinning, not just the other. All right. I mean, I feel like we're we're kind of up in the air here. Uh, but should we push back to August to have some of this information? Try to find out some of this information over the summer regarding enrollment yeah, trends. Maybe uh, why don't we table this until August, revisit it then, and if we've got some information gathered, we can pick up another discussion. And again, as board members collect these kinds of questions, it would be great to, you know, maybe we could create a Google Doc or something that people can just put these mm -hmm. things down as questions and or suggestions that haven't been discussed yet. John, I, I have a quick question for Ben. Um, what is the status of the money we've spent so far on PCI and the architect, et cetera, all that, the money that we've already committed and what's our intention from this point until we decide a direction to go forward? Are they gonna keep working on anything? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, we didn't have any more meetings scheduled, but Jim, in terms of answering the first question in terms of balances, um, we're effectively out of money. Okay. We have a little bit less of PCI, but PC construction and the architect, we spent all of their funds. Okay. Thank you. Is so we're discussing having our next conversation in August. Um, it sounds like in September there's going to be a report back from the new commission. Would it be worthwhile putting an agenda item on the first school board meeting after that also, so that we can tie in that and whatever information we get from that? We have yeah sure. We also have a few um, reports every board meeting, so when things develop and happen, you guys know. Um, I bring those that kind of. Uh, that would be to put something on the agenda. Then I'll just state my personal opinion that we should plan to have a, a discussion directly after, or the first scheduled meeting after the September new commission at the state level. I was going to say I agree with you. I think that way we have we have a little bit of direction from the state. I mean, it may not be actual dedicated direction, but maybe we have a as a, much an as arrow as somewhere. Yeah, right. I'll say this. Like, I, yeah, but this has been, I'll be honest, like you guys have been, you know, we've been together on this ride for a long time now. Like to have something that was so fundamental, like the idea for me was this, it's like we're, the noose is tightening, the noose is tightening on like um, our ability to spend within our means as communities, right? To provide for our students. Our, um, and the the kind of the, the Hail Mary, the lifeline of all of this was that exception clause that I thought everyone had kind of forgotten about. That if you can get your school project um, approved by the state, that that would be outside the penalty phase, right? You wouldn't have this disastrous effect. It's hard enough just to see that tax impact. 
But when that gets taken away, right, that's like, okay, I mean, it's just spent. It's all just spent and, and you can't, right? So until something else happens, we're stuck. You think they just did that to just put everything into one bucket so that they could look at it? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, two, two, I mean, two thoughts. One, I'll say that it's very strange to me that there's a summary of that bill out of the Joint Fiscal Office whose purpose is to talk about the financial implications of legislation, right? And that provision, despite the fact that it takes up multiple pages, it's no reference, no explanation in that summary, right? And I can't get an answer from our, our representatives. It seems like nobody knows how that got in. Right, so that's pretty maddening. Um, but in terms of like uh, where we kind of go from here on it, I I I think for me what I was going to say earlier is now's the time to really express like, hey, do something at the state level, right? Like we're having this problem. One of the reasons, and answer your question on I mean, it, um, you saw the December first letter that came out. Uh, uh, last year, and was, it, you know, starts this political fight between the administration and the legislature. And you know, there's finger pointing going on. And there's, uh, if you go back to that letter, they enumerate the causes of kind of runaway school spending, right? And I don't necessarily agree with that, but that's what's driving the tax rates, right? But um, this letter that comes from the um, tax commissioner says, you know, it's it's the growing cost of maintaining school buildings, mm -hmm. right? And so. We did pass bonds right um, last year to kind of address like the new roof at Killington and like the upgrades to the school right and there's school districts doing that all over the state but now they can't <laughs> yeah, yeah. right they can't spread those costs out though mm -hmm. because who's going to vote for a bond that puts you in you know? yeah and I met with the secretary of education last Friday she had no idea this was even in the law she had no idea the capital cost she had right. no idea the impact. She did not answer to me. So what happens if any high school, middle school, elementary school has a total system failure? What are we going to do? Right. She could not respond. So, so my belief in this legislature that they will do something is very confident. I'm very doubtful. Maybe it's because I've lived in Vermont for 30 years and I've dealt with the agency of education in this legislature, but someone making a decision that hard, that fast, I really don't have the confidence. I think decisions will have to be made within districts. But it seems time to um, develop a very clear, um, you know, sort of message to the legislature to say, this is what needs to change. And for me, it's the, it's the categorical aid question. And that's a, like I said, that's a little bit of a rabbit hole that we go down in terms of how the, the um, financing for that works. But no, no half measures. If you're going to touch it, go all the way, right? Fix it. It's been broken since 2007. Do something, right? And I, you know, personally where I am at, and I hope to bring more along is to send those messages to legislators. We got, like Sherry said, 20 towns that send kids to our high school, right? So that's not just, you know, Allison Clarkson, Natasha Buss, and um, Jim Harrison. There's, there's more uh, legislators whose you know, constituents are in that. I, mean, I do think that we should send a, a letter as a board, as this board, you know, this is where we're at. This is what we're facing, you know, with our constituents. This is what needs to happen. And it's not just be from you or me or whoever else, but like as the board. And, yeah. And maybe generate momentum for a similar situation. Yeah. Well, and maybe other, yeah. yeah exactly. Maybe it'll be put out on campus and where we can gather thousands of signatures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and, one of the things I was, that was so sorry to interrupt, I was just, I was just kind of plead to everyone on Zoom and people sitting here now. I mean, the amount of energy that was focused on the listserv and other posts towards the board and, and other people about this bond and passing it and everything like that. Please take that energy and focus towards the legislature. Please fight with them about the fact that this is that this this needs to change and our community needs it. Um because they're actually legislators are actually ones who are you know being paid to do that job. I mean we're all we're all just sitting here as uh, volunteers doing the best we can. <laughs> so that's that's what I would urge everyone to do. Just your perspective, you know, I mean um the class of what was it 68 open the time capsule on middle school um yeah. about, about three weeks ago yeah uh dennis wright my neighbor president of the alumni association invited you know a couple of board members out there so we um you know were there one of the things that they took out of the time capsule was the uh, document that um talked about the project cost of the middle school in 19 you know, they were getting it going in 1967 what that process was like and it's amazing how little has changed in terms of like 
these are the towns that need to approve it. This is the process. But the difference is that it was a smaller school district. It was just uh, Pomfret, Bridgewater, and Woodstock who were voting, right? And Barnard was just coming into the district at that time, so they weren't voting. There's no X60, so the costs yep. were distributed per capita in terms of the student enrollment. And then, what oh, you want me to? Yeah. Stop that? Thank um, you. And then um, the uh, uh, and then it was there was thirty percent um, aid right from the state. Uh, the statute yeah. goes back that far. So, so and it was in like the it's laughable like the the cost of that building was like in single digit millions right to to build. So, but you could be happy to circulate that. Got well, also, what's in the millions? Yeah. And when you think about it, it's like the, the political process and what we've done mm -hmm. to get this, you know, building off the ground as a board. Um, gosh, if the rules haven't changed on us, you know, we'd be there. Right? Yeah. And the last time that we built these buildings that our students go to, it was just very different. Yeah. yeah. So, if we are not going to be able to pass, any kind of bond for any kind of repair if a system fails. Mm -hmm. um, but they said that fundraising is still exempt. Yeah. Should we start fundraising a rainy day fund for exactly. whatever's going to disaster is going to be striking us? Yeah. We, that's a great like, idea. You know, it'd be great if we could have gotten more response, more uptake from the donor community about our uh, our, our school project, right? But yeah. We but can't we can't get them motivated for. I don't know. I think it's a great. Maybe they'll be motivated. But Right. Yeah. I think it's I've been saying it for a while, like we, we gotta stop being reliant on the states to set our tax rates. We gotta kind of take matters in our own hands. But so I don't think we need to officially table anything because we didn't officially make a motion. Yes. So I think we just are in agreement that we're going to wait and try to get answers and if we can come back to this discussion in August with whatever we know, um, and perhaps figure out some of these suggestions that were made around how how are they going to decide hubs, enrollment projects, um, et cetera? Is that fair to say that we're at this point? Kind of wait and see. Yeah, I think so. Everybody in agreement on Zoom? Okay. Agreed. Then I'm gonna, thank you. I'm going to um, open it for public comment. And I do want to say that. Um, Members of the body and members of the public are prohibited from making personal, impertinent, threatening, or profane remarks. I did hear one comment that was veiled um, that illegal happenings had happened by this board. If that's true, then that needs to be proof needs to be brought for that. I don't want to hear that kind of talk, and I will ask that um, the person who says such things would stop talking and finish his, his or her ideas. So we are now open for public comment. I don't see everybody here. So Larry, raise your hands high if you're gonna. Uh, Mark. Uh, Elliot, I don't know the school board member next to you. Anna. Anna, okay. Nice so, to meet you, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you. Uh, so you mentioned something about September. Nothing's gonna happen between now and August. That board on eight, I've got the joint fiscal office report, which then has two. That 887 establishing uh, the Commission on the Future of Public Education in Vermont and the Education on Fund Advisory Committee. So let me read what it says from, from here. Uh, okay, let, let me find that. That board is, is supposed to start deliberations or meetings, maximum 30 meetings by this summer. They're not required to come up with anything until December of 2025. So if you're waiting to hear from them between you now and then, yeah. what? Yeah. No, long range. No, this the commission, let me find that. Uh, it was in the, in the bill. Oh, my power all right, I, <clears throat> all right. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Commission shall be advised of 13 members. Uh, Secretary of Education for the first meeting of the commission to occur by January, I'm sorry, by July 5th of 2024. And the commission will cease to exist on December 31st, 2025. One education rule that then we've addressed before was, uh, and it's all going there, was passed by the legislature, that's Acts H871. And that's the act relating to the development and updated state state aid to school construction program. 
Uh, that program is supposed to meet before, and they're supposed to come up with recommendations to the legislature by mid-December of 2024. So it can be considered by the next legislature when they meet in 2025. And that's state aid is free education. That's really important for the project. But the other thing that was mentioned in that, in addition to, let me just find that, there's just a lot of information in this. Was it also, uh, it's called State Aid School Construction Working Group. And, okay, they go to six meetings. That's, I'm not sure, but uh, that's one that's gonna come up. And right now, uh, based, based on our project, uh, Remember, the, the preliminary report only approved 82 plus million dollars. Is that correct, Sherry? That was the original. That was the original. Okay, maybe there's another one. Even if we got 30% of that, it would be like 25 million. If the project is back up to 105, we're still going to be floating a bond for close to 80 to 85 million dollars. That sound close? The business guy is behind you. Go ahead. That's fine. Part of the problem with these comment sections, and I don't know if people read about the SDR comments in the listserv the other day, uh, the lack of listening to reflect to people here and getting any answers. I think someone who's very well respected in the community, she supports a school bond. She's a longtime resident and business person in Woodstock, and she just felt that nobody was really listening to her and nobody commented. So the STRs, they got enough petitions to put it back on. But that's a feeling that I see from the school board, from the select board, and the trustees is, it's my way or the highway. You're not gonna get anything passed like that. Trust me. And and and, and, you, and you, you guys can complain about all you want about the AOE. But that's the system we have to deal with. Unless we're gonna do like Killington wanted to do and move over to Hampshire years ago, we're stuck with what we have and to criticize those people is not accomplishing anything. I think your time is up. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Okay. Thank you, sir. Going to you. Jim. So Jim had Connor Killington, uh, spent 15 years on your board. I think there is an option four, which I pushed for six or seven years ago. 1997, I moved into the town of Killington. 1998, at 60 became part of our education tax system that nobody likes. There was too many school buildings, there was a decline in enrollment of students, and there was too much staff. 2024, pretty much the same amount of buildings, a lot more staff, and a lot less um, students. The state is telling you right now in this 887 or 877 that they're looking at fewer and newer. I don't know why we're not looking to go to the state legislators and ask them, are we going to be one of those schools? And what do we need to be to be one of those schools? And if it needs being a thousand or 1200 student capability, then who cares if we're looking for 140 or $158 million ability at 225,000 square feet? I think a lot of people on this board takes it that like I am against us having a great school in this district. I put a lot into this district, put a lot into my kids and for a lot of other kids. We have great staff all around. We have a problem with the state of Vermont on the amount of buildings we have. If you're going to build a building for 600 students, when the state is telling you fewer and newer, it's not going to work. Our cost is going to be up. We talk about, or everybody here talks about on this board, how there's 20 different schools that have school choice and send their kids to our school. Some, not all. But how about trying? You're not going to get them all if you don't build a building with 600 students. This is where I've been coming from for six or seven years. So, you know, when I sit here and I talk, I mean, I'm really trying to, I think this is a great school system. I have three daughters that have gone through it. They're all doing great. It's the staff, okay? 30 seconds. And um, 
I'm just, I, I hope that you guys start going after the state legislators, but in a positive way, instead of saying, you suck. <laughs> they don't like hearing that. How about we will work with you if you work with us for a bigger building on this property and let Woodstock be one of the hubs, fewer and newer. And as far as worrying about how oh, it's time. Oh, it's kind of funny how all the people can get to talk a little bit longer and I think I had. I don't want to hear negative comments about my ability to read a timer. <laughs> May I ask the board for another 30 seconds? I'd, I'd like to be finished. Thank you, Pat. So you went to JCI, you don't like JCI. There are other companies out there, Joe, correct? And, and, and Jim, that do the same kind of financing. That doesn't hit you as a bond. We need to take care of the building that we currently have to make it last through what the state tells us what to do. Okay, or how we're going to do it. So please, let's start thinking outside the box and make it so we're not saying our building is falling apart, but find another person or another company that can come in and keep it away from a bond so we can keep on attracting other students to come here. Or yes, you will have a chance like to keep moving forward. Thank you for your time, boy. Sure. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Anybody else? Anybody on Zoom? I move, to, I move to adjourn. Second. Any discussion on that? <laughs> Any reflection? Yes, uh, reflection. We did not have our reflection. What did we do well? What could we do better? I have a thought. Um, I didn't know where else it belonged, but. Um, I was wondering if we could reflect on the culture in our high school and middle school as far as attracting more students. I think a building is a big component, but also students will want to come to a place where they feel safe and they feel that they will be able to belong. And um, I don't go to the school, so I'm not sure how it feels, um, but I have heard comments from others that at least in the past, um, there were people who didn't feel like they belonged. There were some stomach gaps that um, made people feel uncomfortable. We had a here about possibly uh, religious-based issues. Um, and maybe that's something that we could work on somehow, some way that will not require a bond to be passed that could encourage students to come and stay. Thank you, Lara. I just want to thank everybody for the, um, the discussion tonight. Some pretty big ticket items um, kind of coming through, um, changing the game on us. And I uh, really appreciate everybody's engagement, thoughtful, um, you know, attention to the issue. It's complex and I uh, really appreciate it. And sincerely, um, we would be very happy as the chairs to have uh, thoughts and things like that. Jim, your comments too. If you want to send us things to think about, reflect on, act on, upcoming meetings, or if we say to you, there's a possibility of a meeting in Montpelier, some of us might wanna go as a board. Um, we can keep that an open line of communication throughout the, the next months as the legislature reorganizes and starts to uh, see the impacts that are happening when sweeping cuts have to be made in schools all over the state and what that means to programs in education, Never mind building projects. So let's keep an open uh, door policy on this. Uh, Y'all have my phone number. I I'm retired. Yeah. I am going away for two weeks, taking a group to Peru. So I'll be back July 2. And I honestly have very few plans until January. So thank you. So, okay. I, um, so to Jim's point, I mean, do we have a active advocacy to be on? I know that we're doing everything, we're you know checking all the boxes, but are we actually, is there a possibility to do advocacy to be a hub school? Mm -hmm. Shari sure. probably does a lot. Just yeah, to no, I, 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 I don't know. I, think, I don't think, like she said, it's, it's a concept at this point. I would assume that this group, this commission will be the ones will, that will take it up in a stronger context. And I'm serious when I say I'm willing to attend meetings. 
I'm sure they have a Zoom option or in-person option. I, I have the time to do that now. I just don't think, so just as I shared my conversation with Secretary Saunders, I think now is a great time to start that conversation. Just as she had no idea that we, the capital partner had moved into student expenditure. I think people are locking to that committee with really a clean slate. And this is an opportunity to give them that, um, our context, what we're dealing with. Um, and so I think it's, you know, this is some of the work that can be done this summer. I think it's that campaign, it's the information. You know, we never thought they'd pull 127 as fast as they could, but because of community pressure and stressors, it's an opportunity. But I don't think the people that, that I hear that are being selected for that committee have a different agenda than the agenda we have. You don't think or you do? They have their own personal agendas that they're serving. Okay. And we need them to serve and understand what our community is, our seven towns, our 20 towns are experiencing. And I think they come with their own personal perspective. And we have to take the opportunity to inform that perspective. I'd like to say a few things. Um, I'd like to recognize our audience. I appreciate your time coming here. I know the travel's here. Um, Jim, you don't feel like you're heard. I always take something from what you say. I think it's a great idea for us to reach out to the legislatures and say, what do we need to do to, to position ourselves best to be a hub school if that's the way they go? Um, Mark, I, I appreciate your professionalism and expertise in the legislatures. I heard you in the legislative bills. I heard a lot and learned a lot from you every time you're here. So I appreciate you being here. Well, With that said, and I'd like the Vermont standard to publish this as well. We are all volunteers. And if you would like for us to receive you better and maybe answer questions via email or outside of our member meetings, you need to respect our time, right? And Jim, you know this, we're, we're volunteers. And there was somebody who wrote to the standard recently that said, we're getting paid by taxpayer dollars. I'm here traveling. I, I'm missing dinner time and bedtime with my family to be here to better our community. And so if you want us to spend our time here representing the taxpayer dollars, you need to respect our time and the fact that we're doing this for free. And it's not just this meeting, but we all have committee meetings after this as well. Um, and we've had regular four hour meetings. So. With that said, we would appreciate the respect, and there's been several meetings where we've had to have point of orders because it's become personal. You're not going to get our respect if you don't provide respect to us. So that's a, it's a two-way street, and so we would appreciate that. With that said, I love this board. I love all of the different perspectives that we show. I love, I don't know if y'all can see me on the computer. I love that everybody's here, even if you're remote. Um, I appreciate working with this group, and I, I continue to show up because of this team. So thank you all to the board. Can I just offer a, re a reaction on the part of the media and the audience? It's up to our board chair. So yes, go ahead. Um, this is the third or fourth meeting I've been at with this subject that's been discussed. It would be really useful to the public and to the media who are present if you all had table tents in front of you with your name and the town you <laughs> represent. I used to have those. We went away from that out of two us versus the, the audience yeah. or crowd. Well, but but still, for, I would bet, you know, three quarters of the people in the room at the last meeting on the 7th, even though somebody did ask for the audience for you to go around and identify yourselves, I bet by the end of the meeting, they, don't, they still don't know who you are and where you're from. I can do that, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm just getting to know your faces. I've been in meetings for two years now, so... Um, I think we yeah. promote our forehead. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I would quote you. T-shirts, my man. Cheaper. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome to yeah. the community for our yeah. We do have a motion to adjourn. Um, I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice July. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ernie.